Hey, future doctors. Thanks for joining me on Spoonful of Sugar, a podcast made for medical students by medical students to help the medicine go down. My name is Rhea Mulherker. I'm a student at Drexel University College of Medicine, and I will be your host today. Welcome back, guys. Hope everyone is in a good mood and hope everyone's in the mood to learn and review because today we are going to talk about some of the most common cancers. And this episode titled Cancer Epidemiology will go over some of the most common cancers that affect both children and adults. We'll talk about their risk factors, how they present, where they like to metastasize, basically all the things that board examiners love to ask about the most common cancers. In general... Um, where does cancer stand in terms of causes of death worldwide? I probably didn't phrase that very well, but cancer is the second leading cause of death worldwide. So it's a pretty big deal, and that's why it's so important to know. Um, Do you guys know what the leading cause of death worldwide is? It's heart disease. So in this episode, I'd like to start by discussing the different cancers that affect children, and then we'll move on to adult tumors. Um, in terms of children, uh, they have a lot of different cancers that affect them, obviously, but do you guys know what is the most common cancer overall in children? It's actually leukemias. And do you guys know what the most common type of leukemia is? So ALL, acute lymphocytic leukemia is most common and it's more common than AML, acute myeloblastic leukemia. And do you guys know which cell type is usually predominant in patients with leukemia? It's usually a B cell cancer. Um, But what if the question asks about a leukemia and a patient is presenting with a mediastinal mass? And you'll usually see this in males. What should you think of? Yeah, the mediastinal mass is probably indicative of the thymus. And so that would be uh, T cell involvement. Do you guys know a genetic risk factor for ALL? Trisomy 21, so patients with Down syndrome have a higher likelihood of developing ALL. After leukemia, what are the second most type of can- second most common type of cancers in children? Brain cancers. Um, and do you guys know where the brain cancers usually originate? What region of the brain? We usually divide the brain into two regions, supratentorial and infratentorial. And for children, most of their tumors are going to be infratentorial. So about two-thirds of their tumors are going to be infratentorial. And then for adults, about two-thirds of their tumors will be supratentorial. Do you guys know the most common primary brain tumor in children? It's not necessarily malignant. It's just the most common primary brain tumor. That would be pilocytic astrocytoma. This is a benign, low-grade glioblastoma, and this is an important point. So remember that in children, brain tumors are usually going to be low-grade, whereas in adults, when they develop brain tumors, they're usually going to be high-grade. So on the spectrum of glioblastomas, in children, think low-grade pilocytic astrocytoma. Um, For adults, they're usually usually going to be high-grade lesions, like those grade 4 GBMs that we talk about, the glioblastoma multiforms. Um, And then do you guys know the most common malignant brain tumor in children? That's medulloblastoma. So this is a type of neuroendocrine tumor. So whenever they describe it, you know you're going to see those small blue cells on pathology because it's neuroendocrine. And do you guys know where medulloblastomas tend to metastasize? They usually send what are called drop metastases down to the spinal cord. So that can definitely be dangerous because it can cause compression. Now, if a question ever describes an abdominal mass in a child, cancer should definitely be high on your radar. And so there's two types of abdominal masses in children that I actually want to juxtapose. So the first, uh, what if the question describes a four-year-old child who has a firm, fixed, irregular mass, and you can actually feel it crossing their midline? And this child also has episodes of sudden, random, jerking eye movements, as well as jerky twitching of the arm and leg muscles. What's the diagnosis there? So this is neuroblastoma. And 
Neuroblastoma has a very poor prognosis. It's a very bad tumor to have. And so when you think of these, I just want you to remember that they're bad and you'll remember the other characteristics as well. So it's important that they're irregular in shape, okay? Kind of bumpy when you palpate them. And they also cross the midline. And you can remember this because they're very bad. So you don't want it to be bumpy and you don't want it to cross the midline. Now, what are those symptoms that I was describing? The random jerking eye movements and twitching of the muscles. What is that? So that's something known as opsoclonus myoclonus syndrome. And the reason it happens is because neuroblastoma is basically, think of it as a pheochromocytoma that occurs in children. And so it happens because of the catecholamines that are secreted by the tumor. So opsoclonus myoclonus syndrome, those random jerking movements of the eyes and muscles. And do you guys know um, what this tumor might look like on pathology? So just like pheo, neuroblastoma is also a neuroendocrine tumor. And so you're going to see those small round blue cells that form the rosettes on histology. And this is the second most common solid tumor in children, second to brain cancer. Now contrast that description of an abdominal mass in children to this. Let's say a two-year-old child presents with a smooth mass that can actually be displaced, it's not fixed, and it also does not cross the midline. And this cancer is also often associated with other congenital abnormalities, which are parts of different syndromes. Do you guys know what the diagnosis is here? Yeah, so this is Wilms tumor. Um, it's also known as mesoblastic nephroma. And there's a few different syndromes that can present with a Wilms tumor. But Wilms tumor is generally benign, and it generally has a good prognosis. And remember that Wilms tumor is good, okay, because it's smooth, it can be displaced, it does not cross the midline. These are all good-sounding things. So neuroblastoma is terrible, and Wilms tumor has a good prognosis. Now, do you guys remember some of those genetic syndromes that are associated with Wilms tumor? There's a few. So it's associated with mutations on chromosome 11, and um, some of those muta some of those syndromes are Beckwith-Wiedermann syndrome, uh, Dennis Drash syndrome, the Wagger complex. Remember, that's the one associated with aniridia. These are kind of lower yield syndromes, but it's just good to know that Wilms tumor is on associated with mutation on chromosome 11, and it can be associated with some of those different syndromes. Great. Good job, guys. That sort of wraps up what I wanted to talk about in terms of children. And now we're going to move on to talking about the most common cancers that affect adults. So when we talk about most common, you need to know what's most common in terms of incidence as well as in terms of causes of death. So Incidence. What are the top three causes of cancer in men and women? So in men, number one is prostate, number two is lung, and number three is colorectal. In women, number one is breast, number two is lung, and number three is colorectal. So remember, one is either prostate or breast, two is lung, and three is colorectal. And these are the top three causes of cancer. In terms of cancer death. What are the top three causes of death? It's the same cancers, but in a different order. So lung is the number one cause of cancer death. It's the second common cause of cancer incidence, but it's the number one cause of cancer death. So it's lung and then either breast or prostate for women and men. And then number three is still colorectal. Okay. So just remember that the top three causes of cancer are prostate and breast, followed by lung, followed by colorectal. The top three causes of cancer death are lung, followed by prostate or breast, followed by colorectal. Now, this is something I didn't realize for a long time, but when they calculate the most common cancers, they're excluding the non-melanoma skin cancers. And obviously, the non-melanoma skin cancers are the most common cancers, but they're not included in these statistics. So just keep that in mind. In terms of skin cancers, let's do a quick review. Do you guys know the most common type of malignant skin cancer? It's basal cell carcinoma. And how's that usually described? It's a pearly, waxy lesion. It has raised borders. Sometimes you can see telangiectasias on it. Just remember pearly for basal cell. 
And they always like to ask what part of the lip it shows up on. Do you guys know? The upper lip. Basal cell, for some reason, likes the upper lip more than the lower lip. And do you guys remember where basal cell tends to metastasize? That's a trick question. It really does not like to metastasize. It has virtually no metastatic potential. So remember, basal cell is that pearly waxy lesion, likes the upper lip, and it doesn't metastasize. What's the second most common malignant skin cancer? Squamous cell carcinoma. And how does that look? Just grossly. It's described as an ulcerative lesion with crusting and erosion. On pathology, do you guys remember what the finding is? It's those keratin pearls. That's easy to remember because it's a squamous cell carcinoma, so it's going to have those keratin pearls. And squamous cell looks pretty nasty. It's those ulcerative crusting lesions. Do you guys know what the precursor lesion is for squamous cell? It's actinic keratosis. And do you guys remember what part of the lip squamous cell carcinoma likes to affect? It's the lower lip. So we have basal cell on the upper lip, squamous on the lower lip. And what's the metastatic potential of squamous cell carcinoma? It is high. So especially the lesions that arise on the lower lip, they're going to have a tendency to metastasize. And what's the least common skin cancer? That's melanoma. So what characteristics do you usually look for to differentiate a melanoma from a benign nevus? Remember those A, B, C, D, E criteria? So when patients ask you, how do you know if it's melanoma versus just a regular mole, you look for asymmetry, you look for the borders if they're irregular, you look for color variation, you look for the diameter that's greater than six millimeters, and finally, the E stands for evolution. So is it changing over time? Okay, so once again, A, B, C, D, E. Asymmetry, borders, color variation, diameter greater than 6 millimeters, and evolution if it's changing over time. Does melanoma like to metastasize? You bet it does. And it metastasizes to really weird places. It goes literally anywhere. So lung, liver, brain, those are things you'd normally think of. But it can also go to places like the fat. You can have melanoma metastasizing into the fat. It can go into the colon. It can go into the eyes. So it's not a good cancer. If you were to biopsy a melanoma, what would you use as the best marker of prognosis? If you got this, I'm impressed. So this is the Breslow thickness. Um, that refers to the depth of invasion in millimeters, and that's used to stage the melanoma. So the Breslau thickness or the Breslow depth, like how much it invades into the tissue, is, a, is the best marker for prognosis of the melanoma. Let's talk now about lung cancers. These are the most common cause of cancer death, remember, in adults. So what's the most common cancer in the lung? This is always a trick question. The answer is metastases, okay? In the lung, brain, liver, just remember that if there are cancer cells, they are most likely to be from metastasis, okay? So lung, brain, liver, they usually don't have original cancers. Usually it's metastases that are there. Organs like the colon, breast, prostate, these are organs where it's more likely to be a primary tumor. Now, among the primary tumors of the lung, how do we usually divide the lung cancers? You'll hear uh, people talking about small cell versus non-small cell cancer. And a lot of the cancers are lumped into the general group of non-small cell because just because of how their management and prognosis are. So what's the most common type of primary lung, carcin lung cancer overall? So it's non-small cell and it's the adenocarcinoma, okay? And what kind of patients does this tend to affect? Is it smokers, non-smokers? It actually affects non-smokers. So adenocarcinoma of the lung is scary because patients will get it and they'll be like, oh, I didn't even smoke. And unfortunately, they still have lung cancer. Do you guys know where in the lung it's located? Is it usually central or peripheral? It's usually peripherally located. 
And do you guys know some of the associated mutations with adenocarcinoma of the lung? So KRAS, EGFR, ALK, I don't expect you to memorize these, but it's just good to have in mind that there are certain mutations that are associated with it. And do you guys know what you might find on histology? So it's going to be a glandular pattern, and that makes sense because adenocarcinoma, by definition, is a cancer of glands. So it's have a glandular pattern of the cells. And do you know what it would stain for? It's mucin positive. Again, mucin secreted by the gland, so mucin positive. Now, do you guys know what type of non-small cell lung cancer is found usually in smokers, and it's associated with cavitary lesions? So this is squamous cell lung carcinoma. And where is it located, centrally or peripherally? Usually centrally. Think of the S in squamous standing for centrally. That doesn't make any sense, but the, the S sounds match. So centrally, squamous. Um, do you guys know what you might find on histology? Again, keratin pearls. Makes sense because it's a squamous cell carcinoma. And what perineoplastic syndrome is associated with squamous cell? Hypercalcemia. Do you guys know why? So squamous cell carcinoma can secrete PTH-related protein, so parathyroid hormone-related protein, and that can lead to hypercalcemia. So that's an important perineoplastic syndrome to have in mind. Now, adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma are the biggest non-small cell lung cancers that we need to know. Do you guys know some other ones? So large cell is one. This has a pretty poor prognosis. The cells tend to be highly pleomorphic. And it's actually thought to be kind of a hybrid between small cell and non-small cell. So it doesn't have a great outcome. And sometimes the management is, it's managed sometimes more like small cell. Um, and then finally, there's also bronchial carcinoid tumor. So this is a type of neuroendocrine tumor. And do you guys know what stain neuroendocrine tumors are positive for? It's chromogranin A. And what hormone do carcinoid tumors secrete? They secrete serotonin. And so what symptoms would you expect? Things like flushing, wheezing, diarrhea. These are actually not very commonly seen in patients with carcinoid tumor, but they can happen because of the serotonin secretion. And if it's a test question, you can bet it's probably going to happen. <laughs> um, so another big category of lung cancers is small cell. This is a very, very aggressive tumor, okay? Small cell does not have a good prognosis. Do you guys know where it tends to be located? Centrally or peripherally? Centrally. So again, with that S sound. So squamous and small cell, they both start with this, and they are centrally located tumors, okay? Everything else is usually peripheral. What's the histology finding for small cell? So this is also a neuroendocrine tumor, a lot of neuroendocrine tumors today. Um, so on pathology, you're going to see special nests of these blue cells, and they actually have a name. Do you guys know what that name is? They're called Kulchitsky cells. And what would they stain positive for? As we just mentioned, chromogranin A for the neuroendocrine tumors. And what genetic mutations are associated with small cell? the MYC oncogene mutations, okay? The MYC MYC oncogene mutations. And now, what if a patient presents with a history of smoking and a four-month history of hemoptysis and weight loss, and they are showing progressive proximal muscle weakness, and they feel like their weakness actually improves with some activity and they feel stronger by the end of the day? What syndrome am I describing? So I'm describing Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome. This is one of the perineoplastic syndromes that can happen with small cell, and patients develop antibodies against their presynaptic calcium receptors, and that's called Lambert-Eaton syndrome. It's one of the perineoplastic syndromes. Here's another one. What if the same patient with the history of smoking, four-month history of hemoptysis, weight loss, instead presents with an encephalitis-type picture, they have confusion, maybe they have some seizures. What is this? 
So perineoplastic encephalomyelitis is another possible syndrome. Do you guys know what the antibody is? So it's called the anti-who antibody. That's spelled H-U. Um, it's an antibody against a component of the neurons. But perineoplastic encephalomyelitis can also happen with other cancers. For example, there's anti-yo antibodies with gynecologic cancers, anti-ME2 antibodies with testicular cancers. So perineoplastic encephalomyelitis can happen with small cell, but it can also happen with other cancers. Do you guys know some of the other perineoplastic syndromes seen in small cell lung cancer? Yeah, so Cushing syndrome can happen due to secretion of ACTH. Now, what is the treatment for small cell? Keep in mind it's a very aggressive tumor. So the treatment is usually going to be systemic chemotherapy. Um, it's, small cell actually is very sensitive to chemotherapy. It shrinks very rapidly. Um, if there's a good response, you may consider radiation. The problem is it usually, it usually has a very high metastatic potential, and so that's why it's so aggressive. But an important point to note is that the diagnosis of small cell carcinoma sort of precludes surgery, okay? Patients with small cell are never going to be a good candidate for surgery because it's so aggressive. This is not true for non-small cell lung cancer. If the tumor is operable, uh, then for non-small non cell, we would prefer surgery. Now, let's talk about some of the complications of lung cancer because these are very frequently tested. So let's say a patient has a known lung cancer and they develop facial plethora, arm swelling, dyspnea, and chest pain. What's their diagnosis? I'm describing superior vena cava syndrome. So compression of the SVC by uh, the tumor can lead to these symptoms, the facial plethora, arm swelling. They can have shortness of breath if it's compressing their trachea, and they'll also have chest pain just from you know, the presence of the tumor. And so this can actually be a real emergency. How do you treat? So the first thing you want to do is elevate the head of the bed, make sure that the patient can you know, drain the blood out of their head, and then different treatments are utilized. So they can get an SVC stent. They might be appropriate for radiation therapy, um, but these can be emergencies. Now, what if a patient with lung cancer develops a drooping eyelid, they're describing some discomfort in their eye as well as pain, um, and when you examine them, you see that their pupil is constricted? What is this? This is classic Horner's syndrome. Horner's syndrome presents with ptosis, meiosis, and anhydrosis because the tumor actually compresses the sympathetic trunk on its way to the superior cervical ganglion. So that nerve actually passes right over the apex of the lung, and that's why it's susceptible to compression by tumors that are there. So the one thing I didn't realize when I first learned about Horner's syndrome is that there's different orders of Horner's syndrome because that sympathetic pathway has three different nerves. And so do you guys know what order this is? Yeah, tumor compression is actually second order because it's describing that that second nerve in that pathway. So without too much detail, you should just know that Horner syndrome results from disruption of the oculosympathetic pathway, and the lesions can either be central, so in the brain, they can be preganglionic before that superior cervical ganglion, or they can be postganglionic. And so this is the second order because it's the nerve that's prior to the superior cervical ganglion. Now, what if a patient with lung cancer develops hoarseness? This is simpler. So yeah, compression of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Do you guys know where we find the recurrent laryngeal nerve? So it's different. On the left side, it's around the ductus arteriosus, where the aortic arch connects to the pulmonary artery. And on the right side, it's around the subclavian artery. So this is pretty high up in the chest, and so tumors that are in the apex of the lung can compress that recurrent laryngeal nerve and cause some hoarseness. Now, what's the name? We give a special name to the tumors that are in the apex of the lung, and they can cause all of these syndromes. SVC syndrome, Horner syndrome, hoarseness. What are these tumors called? They're called pancoast tumors. And 
Finally, I want to ask about lung cancer. Where does lung cancer usually metastasize? So it likes to metastasize to some common organs that all cancers like to go to, like brain, bone, liver. Okay, these are pretty common sites of metastasis. And then there's a really weird one. The adrenal glands. So not many cancers like to go to the adrenals, but lung cancers for some reason really do. Whew, so that was a huge review of lung cancer and its complications, and we still have a few more to discuss, but um, I just wanted to really emphasize some of those perineoplastic complications as well as the, um, I guess, mass effect complications of lung cancer because they are commonly tested. This is a long episode, I know, so if you need to take a break and pause and come back, now might be a good time to do so. Um, but if you feel like you can keep going, then we are going to switch gears now and talk about breast cancer. So breast cancer, who gets breast cancer? Obviously women and actually some men, but what age usually? It's usually postmenopausal, but again, not always. What age do we start screening women for breast cancer? We like to do mammograms yearly starting at age 40. Do you guys know risk factors for breast cancer? So estrogen exposure is a big one and that can happen in different ways. So patients who have early puberty or later menopause, they have longer lifetime exposure of estrogen. Patients who were ever on hormonal therapy, patients who had an older age at their first live birth, um, as well as obesity. Do you guys know why obesity would increase your estrogen exposure? So adipose tissue contains an enzyme aromatase, which actually converts androstenedione to estrone. And so um, having extra adipose tissue, such as when people are obese, that can lead to increased estrogen exposure. And then what about certain mutations? So yeah, the big ones, the BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations increase your risk of breast cancer. So whenever patients have breast cancer, we look for markers. Do you guys know what markers we look for? These are not to be confused with mutations. These are actual markers that we can find in the tissue. So we look for estrogen and progesterone markers. You'll hear people talking about ER, PR positive tumors. And why is that important? if they have the estrogen and progesterone markers. The ER and PR stand for estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor. So the ER, PR positive tumors have a good prognosis because we can treat them with selective estrogen receptor modulators. Do you guys know what drugs we might use? Yeah, drugs like tamoxifen, raloxifen. What's the difference? So a big one to know is that tamoxifen agonizes the estrogen receptors at the uterus as well, and so it actually increases your risk of endometrial cancer. Raloxifen, on the other hand, does not. And these drugs are good to use in postmenopausal women. So just remember, estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, these are good prognostic markers. There's another marker that we can sometimes look for, and it carries a poorer prognosis, but it can still be treated with a specific drug. What marker am I thinking of? I'm thinking of the HER2 receptor. Do you guys know what drug we use against it? That would be trastuzumab, or the brand name is Herceptin. And what's the side effect of trastuzumab? The big one you need to know is cardiotoxicity. And do you guys know what markers on a breast carry on a breast tumor carry the worst prognosis? The triple negative tumors. So if they're ER, PR, and HER2 negative, we call them triple negative. And it makes sense that they have a terrible prognosis because there's no specific agent that we can use to target them. So we just have to rely on regular chemotherapy. Now, let me ask you about some specific types of breast cancer you need to know. So what do we call an early ductal malignancy that has not yet invaded the basement membrane? If it hasn't invaded the basement membrane, it's in situ. So we call it ductal carcinoma in situ. Now, what if that glandular atypia worsens and it actually does invade the basement membrane? 
At this point, it would be called invasive ductal adenocarcinoma. This is the most common type of breast cancer, and it also has the worst prognosis, unfortunately. Now, do you guys know what type of breast cancer likes to spread in a linear Indian filing pattern? This is invasive lobular carcinoma. And the reason it likes to spread in that linear pattern is because we downregulate the E cadherin expression. E cadherin is one of those adhesion molecules, and it downregulates expression of that, and so it ends up spreading in a linear pattern. Now, what kind of breast cancer is associated with the peau d'orange appearance of the skin? Because it infiltrates the Cooper's ligaments. Sometimes when they describe the presentation in the question stem, it can be confusing because it sounds like mastitis. This is inflammatory breast carcinoma. So inflammatory carcinoma, the cells actually infiltrate the Cooper's ligaments and that kind of pulls on the breast skin, causing that dimpling peau d'orange appearance. And then finally, what is it called if a patient who has underlying DCIS or invasive ductal carcinoma presents with eczema-like skin changes on their nipple? It's like red, itchy, kind of flaky. What is that? That's Paget's disease of the breast. So usually um, patients will present with the skin finding first, and then you have to look for an underlying malignancy because Paget's disease is usually from some kind of underlying cancer that has metastasized and has affected the skin as well. Now, what organs does breast cancer like to metastasize to? Typically, it likes to go to places like the bone, liver, lungs, and brain. So bone and lungs make a lot of sense because they're very close to the breast, and so it's obviously going to be able to go to them very easily, like the rib um, or else the lungs. And then the liver and brain are also common sites of metastasis, so that's how you can remember those. And do you guys know how we treat breast cancer? It kind of varies depending on the patient, what the patient wants, and how severe the cancer is, but it's usually some combination of surgery with chemotherapy or hormonal therapy, as well as radiation. Um, and do you guys know some complications of breast surgery? Let's say, for example, that a patient undergoes a partial mastectomy with axillary dissection and later develops swelling of her arm. Do you guys know the diagnosis there? lymphedema. And do you guys know what malignancy can result from long-term lymphedema? So patients can actually get what's called lymphangiosarcoma from long-term lymphedema. Um, now what if a patient undergoes surgery and then develops medial winging of the scapula, causing the scapula to kind of project outward? So this can happen during surgery if there's injury to the long thoracic nerve. So the long thoracic nerve, remember from anatomy, innervates the serratus anterior muscle. And so if that nerve is clipped, then the serratus anterior doesn't work and it kind of causes the scapula to medially wing. And that makes it look like it's pushing outward. Let's switch gears now and talk about prostate cancer. So who gets prostate cancer? It's usually older men. It's very common in older men. And you'll often hear the saying that most men are going to die with prostate cancer rather than from prostate cancer. But it's still really important to treat because metastases can be devastating. Prostate cancer loves to go to the bone. It can cause spinal cord compression. It can be very painful. So what region of the prostate does prostate cancer usually arise? It usually arises in the peripheral zone of the prostate, okay? And this is in contrast to benign prostatic hypertrophy, which usually occurs in the central zone. So how do we diagnose prostate cancer? Usually, we're going to check the PSA, um, the prostate-specific antigen level, and if it's monitored for a long time, uh, a suspicious rise in the PSA can be indicative of prostate cancer, or if it's high off the bat, we might just jump straight to um, a core needle biopsy of the prostate. Do you guys know recommendations for PSA screening? 
So it's actually controversial, but generally it's recommended that men talk to their PCP around age 50 and make an informed decision about whether or not they want to check the PSA. If they do check, though, they need to be followed yearly. Now, what is the treatment for prostate cancer? What do we usually do? It can be surgical, so transurethral a resection of the prostate, or it can be using radiotherapy. So we can use radiation with or without androgen deprivation therapy. And do you guys know for androgen deprivation therapy what drug we might use? An androgen receptor antagonist? Something like flutamide. Good. And now where does prostate cancer like to metastasize? It goes to the bones. Prostate cancer loves the bones. And do you guys know what specific type of lesion we usually see on the bone? It's usually going to be an osteoblastic lesion. And I don't know why this phrase helps me remember, but I always say in my head, blast the prostate. And I just remember that prostate cancer sends osteoblastic lesions to the bone. This is in contrast to lesions that we get from breast cancer or multiple, multiple myeloma. Usually those lesions are osteolytic, but prostate specifically, you need to know that those bone lesions are osteoblastic. So blast the prostate. And that pretty much sums up what I wanted to talk about for um, prostate cancer. That was a short one. And then the last most common cancer that I want to discuss in adults is actually colorectal cancer. So this is the home stretch. Thanks for hanging in so far. We're just going to talk about colorectal cancer, do a quick review, and then we'll be all finished. So colorectal cancer. I'll ask you the same question. Who does colorectal cancer usually affect? So generally, we think of patients that are older than age 50, but it's actually increasingly being seen in patients who are in their 40s or even in their 30s, especially in the U.S., and that's thought to be due to a poor diet, um, diets that are low in fiber, increased consumption of alcohol. So the incidence of colorectal cancer is definitely increasing, and it's starting to affect younger individuals, which is scary. So what are risk factors for colorectal cancers? So some of the ones I just mentioned above, diets that are low in fiber, increased consumption of alcohol, and then there's some syndromes you need to know. So familial adenomatous polyposis is one, as well as Lynch syndrome. So let's talk about FAP first, familial adenomatous polyposis. Which mutation is present in that syndrome? It's a mutation in the APC gene. So these patients actually have a 100% likelihood of developing colon cancer. And so we start screening them at a very young age. And unfortunately, they usually have to undergo colectomy in their 20s. Now, what about Lynch syndrome? What mutation causes that? So Lynch syndrome is caused by mutations in MHC genes, which are in the microsatellite instability pathway. And we'll talk a little bit about these syndromes in a bit. What are some other risk factors for colorectal cancer? So inflammatory bowel disease is one. Anytime there's ongoing chronic inflammation to a site, um, that definitely increases your risk of cancer. So which inflammatory bowel disease has a higher risk of causing cancer, Crohn's or ulcerative colitis? Usually we think of ulcerative colitis, and for these patients, we want to actually start doing a colonoscopy eight years after their diagnosis because they have such a higher risk of developing colon cancer. And then, as I mentioned already, low-fiber diet, alcohol, and tobacco use as well. Um, is a risk factor for cancer. Do you guys know what we recommend for screening of colon cancer? Usually we want to get a colonoscopy every 10 years starting at age 50, unless there's a family member who has a diagnosis of colon cancer, in which case we want to start screening 10 years before the age that the family member was diagnosed, whichever comes first. If we find that there are certain findings on colonoscopy, like polyps or other lesions, then sometimes they'll want to get a colonoscopy more frequently than 10 years, maybe every three years or every five years. Now, what if the patient adamantly refuses a colonoscopy? They really don't want to get a colonoscopy. What can you recommend for them for screening? 
or are they just out of luck? No, so you can recommend that they undergo flexible sigmoidoscopy, which is less invasive. They can do that every three years. Or they can get stool occult blood testing every year. But these are both inferior to the full colonoscopy, and you really want to push for, uh, for that in your patients. So let's talk now about some of these genetic mutations, as I mentioned above. Um, what's the most common pathway for genetic mutations? Do you guys know? So it's something called the chromosomal instability pathway, and that's the one that's associated with the APC mutation. So usually patients will first develop an APC mutation, followed by a mutation in KRAS, and finally a P53 mutation. So it's kind of sequential. The KRAS mutation increases their risk for adenoma, and then the P53 mutation finally is what causes the cancer. And this APC mutation is what is seen in patients with the FAP syndrome, the familial adenomatous polyposis. Patients with Lynch syndrome had which mutation? They had the MHC mutation. So this is a different pathway. This is the microsatellite instability pathway. Um, and as I mentioned, that is seen in Lynch syndrome or hereditary non-polyposis colon cancer. Now, how does colon cancer usually present? So classically in textbooks, you'll learn that um, the presentation of colorectal cancer kind of depends on the side. So what symptoms do we associate with a right-sided cancer or a cancer that involves the ascending colon? Usually you think of iron deficiency anemia and weight loss because patients are losing blood, but they can't really tell because it's higher up in their colon. Maybe they'll have darker stool, um, but they're kind of just losing blood. Um, and then what about cancers that present on the left side involving the descending colon? What symptoms would they have? So this is described as the patients with the pencil-thin stools. They'll have some colicky pain. They may or may not have hematochesia. That's what you'd associate with a left-sided mass. Now, in real life, um, all patients after 50 should definitely get that screening colonoscopy. And if you see an elderly person with iron deficiency anemia, think of colorectal cancer unless proven otherwise. You really want to rule out cancer in these patients. Now, what tumor marker do we use for colorectal cancer? We use something called carcinoembryonic antigen, or CEA. And now what purpose do we use it for? Is it to diagnose or to monitor? It's to monitor, okay? CEA is not good for diagnosis, but it does help monitor the response to treatment and progression. And you'll kind of find that that's true of a lot of different tumor markers for across different types of cancer. It's not necessarily sensitive or specific to make a diagnosis, but it does help monitor response to treatment and if the cancer recurs. Where does colon cancer like to metastasize? The liver. Colon cancer loves to go to the liver. And usually when you see masses in the liver, they're going to be metastases, probably from colon cancer. Colon cancer also loves to go to the brain. Now, how do we treat colon cancer? It's usually a combination of surgery and chemotherapy as well as radiation. So take a deep breath because that was a lot of information about a lot of different types of cancer. I know I went into a lot of detail about different things, but um, I really hope that you got a good review of the most common cancers and some of the highly testable topics about these cancers. So really quick, if you have the energy, I want to do a two-minute recap, and then we will conclude. So my quick recap Leukemias and then brain tumors are the two most common cancers in children. And then remember, we also talked in them about the abdominal solid tumors. So neuroblastoma, that was the bad one that was irregular in shape, crossed the midline, and then Wilms tumor. That was the good prognosis that was smooth, did not cross the midline. In adults, we talked about skin, lung, breast, prostate, as well as colon cancer. The non-melanomatous skin cancers are the most common. And then lung cancer is the second most common in terms of incidence, but it's the most common in terms of death. In terms of metastases, the takeaways I want you to have. So 
organs such as the brain, lung, liver, any cancer that's there is most likely to be a metastasis rather than a primary tumor. What special organ did we say lung cancers like to metastasize to? They like to go to the adrenal glands. That's really weird. But they also like to go to the brain, bone, and liver. What organs do breast cancers like to metastasize to? They like to go to the bone, the lungs, the liver, and the brain. Now, where does prostate like to go to? Remember, prostate loves the bone. And what type of lesion does it form? Osteoblastic. Remember, we said blast the prostate. And where does colon cancer like to go? It can go to the liver. It can go to the brain. So thank you so much for listening to this whole spiel. If you stuck with this, uh, you're a real trooper, and I really appreciate uh, the effort. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please visit our website at spoonfulofsugar.org, and you can post them there. If you found this episode helpful, please subscribe, give us a rating or a review. Um, I can tell you from my personal experience that cancer was a huge SOS topic, uh, but hopefully one episode at a time, Spoonful of Sugar can help the medicine go down. 